again, everyone. Welcome back to the Fandom Zone podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skaggs, back in the Fandom Zone, ready to talk more The Boys Season 2 with my wonderful co-host and soon-to-be new uncle, DJ Nick. How you doing, Nick? Hey, Charles. This indeed, call me the man from uncle, I guess <laughs> one could say. <laughs> but yeah, no. I'm... Or the uncle from man. There you go. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. And as you said, I'm very, very happy. I recently got the news that my sister, you know, is pregnant with her first kid. You know, so I'm very, very excited about that. And uh, as well, it's you a weird be. feeling. You know, it's a weird feeling. Granted, it's not my child, but I kind of have that giddiness almost of, you know, kind of parenthood, which is kind of fun. Um, so looking forward to, to getting this, uh, you know, my niece into all these geeky, fun things you know, that you and I also enjoy. Exactly. You have to start them young. I know that. I personally, you know, I, I corrupt my nieces and nephews. I send them Funkos every year for Christmas. And Sweet. So, uh, you know, and I do all these, you know, special requests for them. I try to track everything down. But I do try and encourage the geeky side of things. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So, my congratulations to you and also, obviously, your sister on your impending nephew. Niece. Niece. That's right. I'm sorry. You did say niece, niece. didn't you? So yes. yes, I, I stand corrected. I apologize. No, no problem. No problem. No judgment. Yeah, we but yeah, no, exactly. And we definitely need, you know, some geeky fun stuff in these rather dismal times. Dare I say? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, obviously, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, but thankfully, the Fandom Zone has you covered. We're here to be that bright ray of sunshine on an otherwise cloudy day. Yes. And we're going to do that by discussing. Hey, what else? Super violence. So. <laughs> Yeah, bring on the ultraviolence. Exactly. So here at episode 192 of the Fandom Zone, we're going to be talking proper preparation and planning. Say that three times fast. Yeah. Which is, of course, the second episode of The Boys Season 2 aired not too long ago on September 4th, 2020, as they released the first three episodes all in a batch, which was very nice of them. Written by Rebecca Sunshine, who wrote the Season 1 episodes the Innocence and You Found Me, the season one finale, I believe. Yeah. And this one was directed by Liz Friedlander, who has never directed for the boys before, but previously directed episodes of Jessica Jones, American Horror Story, and The Gifted, wow. as well as a ton of music videos from, mm. say, like the mid-90s to the mid-2000s mm. for various artists, including... Hey, you two, R.E.M. And, and others. So I thought that was rather neat. Quite the impressive CV there. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, if you if you look up uh, Liz Friedlander on the on the Wikipedia's, I think you'd be very impressed by her music video resume. A lot of very diverse music video resume, I might add. Cool. Lots of things for everybody, including country artists. So, of course, I think you might be very interested, Nick. <laughs> I'll certainly check it out for sure. And and may I actually open this a brief parenthesis here? Another thing that I really love about this show yes. is the music. The soundtrack is incredible. I know you already um, put together your own kind of personal soundtrack to this season. Yes, I and did. The music. Once again, the music here is just fantastic. There yeah. it is. Yep. <laughs> Holding it up in my hot little hands on the CD. Physical media, you guys. So, yeah, something I, I burned and I'm in the process of working on some nice cover art for. But, yeah, uh, that's one of the things we didn't talk about in our previous episode was the music. So it's glad, I'm glad you brought that up because, once again, The Boys Season 2 doing some fabulous music. And this episode, no exception. We get more Billy Joel in this episode, which is a very running theme in season two, especially. They seem to really like him, yeah. We kind of got a little bit of a taste in season one as it was revealed that Huey is a bit of a Billy Joel fan. Bam. And we actually get a little explanation for that later on in this season, which I won't spoil just yet. But Billy Joel songs are pretty prominent in this season, especially. Yeah. This time we get like You're Only Human, this parentheses, second win close parentheses and we also get great other songs like psycho killer by talking yeah. heads always a, always a good one to hear iris by the goo goo dolls which is kind of like a nice little bit of 90s cheese that goes down yeah. so well from the city of angels <laughs> soundtrack and a great hilarious cover of joe cocker's you are so beautiful by none other yeah. than the deep skills <laughs> Voiced by the wonderful Patton Oswalt. 
Yeah. In fact, I was like, is that Patton Oswald? Because that voice seemed very familiar. It no is. Surprise. It, it, it is. is Agent Koenig from, uh, from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, points to you, sir, for uh, associating that with uh, comic book TV <laughs> reference. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, now, the Deeps, you know, there, we, we got a lot of things to talk about in this episode. So uh, after I do the trivia, I want to break it down into four topics. We may want to talk about the deep just a little bit afterward if we have time. Sure. But I think there's some more important stuff going on that I think we should discuss, if that's okay with you. Agreed. Oh, yes, totally. All right. A little bit of trivia this time. Proper preparation and planning. I'm amazed I haven't been tripped up by that yet. That title comes from The Boys comic book series, issues number 48 through 51 which was another four-part story. This time, differences between the TV show and the comic. This version, or excuse me, the comic book version, was the kind of revealed the full story of why Butcher has a vendetta against superheroes, soups. And oh. it gets revealed with the story of the boys' first meeting with the Seven. So their first ever meeting. So if you're at all curious about that... I definitely recommend checking out 48 through 51 of the boys comic book series. Also during the storyline, they get to reveal more of Vought's part in the events of nine 11. So oh. again, more, more kind of social commentary from Garth Ennis in this one relating to nine 11, of course. So I just thought I'd mention that for uh, anybody who might be interested in checking out the comics. And then one other thing that I thought was interesting was talking about the deep. He kind of takes this, hallucinogenic mushroom tea at one point during this episode, which, of course, triggers his little conversation with his own gills. <laughs> and after he drinks the tea, he goes and listens to the song Iris by the Goo Goo Dolls, which is something we've mentioned in the music. And that is, for, like I said, from the si soundtrack to City of Angels, yeah. which, of course, stars Meg Ryan, who, hey, is the mother of none other than Jack Quaid, a.k.a. Huey Campbell. It's all connected. It's all connected. <laughs> I'm sure that was a kind of a deliberate musical choice. Very clever, very clever. Yeah, so I just thought that was interesting. A little, nice little nod to Jack Quay's relationship to his mom, Meg Ryan. So like I said, we have four topics. So let's, topic number one, let's talk about Butcher Huey. And let's also talk about Grace Mallory. Mm. because we get a little bit more of Grace Mallory and her connection to Butcher. And yeah. so I thought that was interesting to explore. Butcher, um, you know, obviously he had shown up just at the very end of the previous episode. So now we we kind of get the little full backstory a little bit of, even though we don't get really, I think, all the events, we kind of get enough of mm. an explanation about what happened between the events of the cliffhanger to season one and when he shows up yeah. at the boys hideout at the end of last episode. So what were your thoughts on, on butcher in this episode? He's good. There's a lot going on with him. <laughs> Obviously he's still reeling from being reunited with his wife, Becca and finding out that she has a son that, Hey, looks a lot like Homelander. And then all of a sudden he he wakes up in the parking lot of this restaurant in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Yeah. So what, what did you make of Butcher in this episode? Well, as you said, there is a lot going on with this character. And, uh, you know, the, the one of the big things that I actually got from this was he almost seems concerned about losing power when it comes to the, the boys. Yes. Should we say his position as chief? He almost seems to constantly want to remind everybody that he's in charge. So it makes you wonder whether he either feels that uh, he's either losing ground with them. And so he ha kind of has to hammer in the whole concept that he is the chief and yeah. he, what he says goes. And he does this quite a bit, which almost could seem like, an, you know, it seems like the lady doth protest too much. So it's almost like he seems rather... Um, like he is not completely secure of his position right now. And he seems rather insecure about himself. Um, outside of that, so there's also, I think, that whole fact, like you said, of finding out that Becca is alive and well, and that she's got, of course, uh, this child whom, like you said, apparently is Homelander's kid. Apparently, at this point, that's what we're, what we're told. Certainly it looks and like him, right? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, the, the likeness is definitely there. And, 
we know, granted, we don't see what happened when he's actually in front, was, you know, placed there in front of the house. And because he just basically wakes up in the middle of the street, rushes into the restaurant and, and goes like, where the F am I? Um, mm-hmm. But uh, it's, I just think that he, in his mind, he just, that's, that's what's playing, that scenario in his mind is what, re- what really went down when it came to Becca and Homelander, because he's been under the constant assumption that she was raped and that he kind of, you know, that almost that Homeland almost did to spite him. And now there's this whole thing of a child and stuff. And so he's maybe rethinking was was, you know, was this consensual or was Becca really raped? I wonder, because it kind of makes him wonder, I think. I think he's maybe questioning that. And also the fact that, you know, maybe she never reached out to him and never tried to get in contact with him, which could also be playing on his mind, too. And at the same time, he's herding these wild cats that are the boys <laughs> and going, OK, guys, we have to do this. We have to do this. We have to do this. And also trying to get back into the good graces of uh, Mallory as well and the and the CIA and what have you to, you know, have their their um, criminal records. Yeah. And criminal records sponged. Yeah. Because you bring up a great point because yeah, there's still one in fugitives and, and there's a great scene of that when butcher enters the restaurant in Fort Wayne and he's talking to like a waitress or someone and there's a TV mounted in the corner on the wall and it's talking about the, you know, the boys being fugitives. And so the waitress does a double take, looks at the TV, looks at him, looks back at the TV and Butcher is kind of forced to kind of hurry up and get out of there before the authorities are called. So he's got a lot on this plate, obviously. Emotionally, he's he's probably pretty compromised at this point because of reeling from, you know, the whole thing with Becca and her son and what that might mean and, and how that if, may affect their relationship going forward. So there, he's going through this whole tumult of emotion, and consequently, he's just solely focused on getting back with Becca, and is pretty much at the point, I think, of willing to do anything to make that happen, no matter who it costs or what the you know what ramifications there might be. Um, he seems perfectly willing to pay the price. You know, the question is whether his teammates and the boys, especially Huey, are willing to pay that price as well. Yeah, which is where, you know, we see they kind of butt heads towards the end. And, of course, we will, we'll, of course, get to the whole Kamiko and her brother situation as well, which was a big deal in yeah, this Yeah, I want to save too. that for our fourth topic, yeah. Certainly, yeah. And, and yeah, he's prepared. He, he almost like nobody else kind of matters. It's all about me. I'm going to have to take, you know, because it's all about Becca. You know, it doesn't matter who said, who cares who gets killed in the process. I'm going to sort of focus laser focus on this and on becca and all this and everything that's that is within becca's periphery so i think that's that's what it's all about to him and you know we find him also scribbling uh, you know i think his memories as it were of the of what had happened in crayon on that piece of paper on the um, table mat or what, what whatever it was it looked like a table mat placement Place yeah, mat, yeah. yeah. And he's just penciling this in crayon. He's hurt. He's so desperate to try to remember everything that he can before he forgets it and trying to write down all these details, even in in crayon, which is all he has available from because it's like a kind of like a kid's thing at at restaurants that, you know, he's he's scribbling all this down and and hoping that it'll help him find her later because he he doesn't know exactly where she is. All he's relying on is what he saw at this point. That's right. Yeah, his whatever his as any potential clues to her location. Yeah, I mean, and also I, I thought it was interesting. You even put down the position of the sun and this kind of thing. I'm like, okay, I guess that might help you. I don't know if that will help you as much, but okay. Yeah, well, maybe. Yeah, you never know. At least you know the position. Yeah, oh, because the sun hits the house at a certain angle, so I guess that's what he's. <laughs> well, I mean, he's desperate. He's obviously desperate. Yeah, at this point. totally. Sure, sure. Yeah, of course. So Butcher shows up at basically meets up with Grace Mallory, his one of his mentors from an earlier incarnation of the boys who works at the CIA, attending the funeral of Rainer, who yeah. had her head exploded in previous episode. <laughs> yes, which we kind of mentioned in a throw off moment <laughs> last episode. Oh, yeah. By the way, she gets her head exploded. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah, right. Nice little. <laughs> I'm guessing that was closed casket. Just a, yeah. just a hunch. <laughs> Just a hunch. Yes, I think so too. <laughs> but Mallory's there, goes to the funeral, and she goes back to her car. And of course, Butcher's hiding 
there in her car talks about how I guess there was some bad blood. She said she wouldn't see him again, and she's willing to turn him in for Madeline Stillwell's murder. She doesn't believe that he's innocent of that, but he tells her in a, in a kind of a, a desperate move on his part, very risky move. He says, well, I know who killed Rainer, which he yeah. doesn't at this point. He doesn't know that. I guess he's grasping at straws. He's, he's bluffing. Just well, he's bluffing. That's what he does. So Grace, you know, is like, okay, give me the name. And he says, well, I don't have that answer yet, but I do know how to get it. And so essentially he suggests – he comes up with this idea that the, apparently Vought had Rainer killed because she was getting too close to the super terrorist that was smuggled into New Jersey. So she doesn't believe him. Yeah. And Billy says, well, if they find the terrorist, then uh, they'll find Ray Rainer's killer. So essentially he's looking yeah. for her support to go do that. And so if I do this for you, will you help me out? Yeah. That's right. It's kind of a tit for tat situation. This is the, this is the bargain, the the quid pro quo, if you will. Yeah. Quid pro quo, Clarice. <laughs> nice. And I actually have a question here. Yes. When yes. She knows he's around because she sees fruit, in, you know, or like a basket of fruit. Edible. Ed, ed, the, one of those edible arrangements. Yeah. That's right. You know, among these little floral things. Yeah. Now, and um, she, she kind of like you, looks like it's like really fruit. <laughs> At a fruit at a funeral, come on. So I guess that's how she. I mean, unless it was like almost a um, code, if you will. Previously, they would do that, or she'd know that the only man wacky enough to do that would be would be butcher. butcher. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I'm I'm kind of leaning toward the latter on that one. That the only person classless enough to do that would be butcher. <laughs> that's right. That would be my guess. But I um, so, yeah. but I did find it interesting. Um, going back to Huey, now, early in the episode, Huey kind of calls out Butcher, um, yeah. complaining that Butcher left them for dead. And he's kind of looking for some backup from the other members of the boys, but gets nothing, gets crickets. Yeah. And that's right. And then Butcher kind of turns it around. You know, he's trying to say, well, you know, I, I'm sorry. I didn't, you know, say like, you know, that uh, I'm sorry that I didn't trust you guys to protect yourselves. So mm -hmm. essentially Butcher tries to make himself look more like the victim here, the bad guy with with Huey yeah, in front exactly. of the, in front of the others. And Huey points out that that Butcher blew up Stillwell and Butcher's like, no, she, you know, she was already dead before I blew her up. <laughs> so. <laughs> It was like that when I got here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But um, so, so this is kind of simmering in Butcher's head, so that um, by the end of the episode, when mm. um, when uh, you know they go through the whole issue with with trying to um, essentially Huey knocking down Butcher before he can kill Kamiko's brother, that. Um, Butcher gets very angry and lashes yeah, that's out. That's basically the last straw for him. Exactly. And it just lashes out as like just when everybody's getting ready to get back in the van, Butcher decks Huey and says, look, yeah. if you know, if you come between me and my wife again, I'm going to kill you hmm. and threatens him right there. So uh, that's going to make it for a very awkward van ride home, needless to say. <laughs> yes. I wonder who's going to break the ice there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> But I gotta wonder, yeah, like, oh, what's, nobody else is gonna be like, okay, why does, you know, Huey gets back in the van, his lips bleeding like crazy. Nobody takes <laughs> note of this. Like, nobody cares. Like, <laughs> like you, would, uh, you would think oh, one well, of them. You, know. you think one of them would like, go, hey, what's up? At least, at least, mother's milk would go like, hey, what do, you, what, what did you do that? So, but nobody, everybody yeah. just like, oh, that's just butcher being butcher, I guess. He just got a little bit rough with with Huey. That's just his way, I guess. It's like okay, on moving, moving on, you know. Yeah. Kind of so, were you shocked by that moment, or did you totally see it coming? Well, 
Well, you know what? I kind of did see it coming because, like you had mentioned, it was an escalation of Huey literally getting on Butcher's nerves and then some. And so it was just kept, you know, kept pushing him and pushing him and pushing him. And as you mentioned, when he knocks um, Butcher down, when he's about to kill him, he goes, brother, that's literally a last straw for him. And I thought he was going to deck him then and there. But obviously, Frenchie and, and Mother's Milk are kind of restraining him. And I thought when they when they kind of let him go, he'd probably be able to get a punch in, knowing how sneaky Butcher is. Instead, you know, he just calmly pointed a finger at him and kind of almost gave him one of his little smiles there, and that was that. Right. But then, of course, I'm, I, I thought to myself, but th- this is Butcher we're talking about. This is Billy Butcher. He's not going to let this go. You no. know that when he has a at the at the opportune moment, he's going to going to really show how he feels. And so don't, we got don't that. Don't be that a C. <laughs> exactly. Let's just put it there. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so I mean, it's pretty. It's perfectly keeping in in um, in line with 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 Billy's character. So it does not surprise me. But the fact that, as I said, he's made this now so personal. It's just about Becca. You know, it's almost like screw the rest. It's all about my stuff. Once again, it's he almost seems to be becoming more selfish. If you will, I mean, I understand why he's doing it. Like, I mean, it's not right. I blame the guy. But before he seemed more of the team leader as in I'm taking other people's concerns into consideration somewhat as well. But he does seem to be getting a little bit more autocratic. You know, selfish about it. Yeah, an autocratic and a dictator. You know, that's yeah. why him and Homelander, not so different. <laughs> well, we talked we talked about that last episode, how they're kind of two sides yeah. of the same coin, those yeah. two. And now, without getting into spoilers, because of having read the comic run, yeah, uh, and I don't know exactly how the sh- Eric Kripke and the other showrunner, you know, the showrunner is going to handle um, things going forward. The, any differences between the comic and the TV show? But I, I, I would like to point out, I want everybody, especially you know, since you, Nick, since you haven't read the comics, mm-hmm. keep a close watch on the relationship between Butcher and Huey. It's okay. very vital to the long-term story of the boys. And it's very complex and very involved. And um, and presumably there will be some big payoffs down the road without getting into the detail. So, so I think that's something you should definitely watch. And also keep an eye on why Butcher is doing what he's doing. Uh-huh. His moti- okay. his motiva- yeah. his motivations. You know, you talked about yeah. how he seems very focused on Becca, and yeah. and um, and as a re- and his actions as a result of that fixation. So, so keep an eye on that. I'm just going to leave that there. I'm going to tease that because obviously I don't want to spoil anything. No, no, totally. But, but I, mean, I, I actually, but I think it's something yeah, that ahead. I think it's something that viewers should pay attention to. Well, you know what? I'm actually planning as a, you know, almost a Christmas slash Hanukkah present to myself of getting the trade paperback of the boys. So oh. uh, at least I'll be able to catch up on my reading. So, okay. yeah, that's on my little, you know, what, my my birthday present to myself. You know, to Nick from Nick, you know, happy, happy Hanukkah, <laughs> happy, happy, Merry Christmas, you know. Excellent. And so it's like, oh, yeah, how thoughtful of me. <laughs> give, the, but, yeah. give the gift of Billy Butcher. And the boys. That's right. Yeah. The gift that keeps on giving. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to let me yeah, know so once you, when you. You have to let me know once you start uh, going through those issues. I'm, I'd be kind of curious to gauge your reaction reading some of those. Because well, I'm also very curious to see how much it also differs from the you know from the TV show. Yeah. I mean, so far, would you say it's pretty um, faithful, or have there been major departures? I would say it's about a fifty percent faithful. Okay. So there are some con- notable differences, um, especially with um, with Becca and who's uh, simply Becky in the comics, and mm. um, some of the things going on um, with with Vought and um, and and especially Butcher. So. Right. So I mean, so, I know there's a lot so of gender swapping and stuff. There is some gender swapping, and the, there's been some things toned down. I think, if you can believe it, things toned down on the boys. <laughs> so, um, 
Yeah, I'd, I'd say you know there, there's it's generally faithful, but um, but there are some pretty glaring differences, and okay. which is good in the sense that it's not you know adhering so closely to the book that it's going to be predictable. That's right. Yeah, there, I mean there could be like an unexpected change down the road, kind of like with what The Walking Dead did, that uh, mm. from the comic book series that um, yeah. you kind of had a general roadmap, but you didn't feel like it was just going plot point by plot point by plot point and right. making it kind of predictable. And then all you would have to do is just read the comics to find out what happens. Yeah. I mean, as we For sure. said in Doom Patrol, you know, same deal. Yeah. Well, you mean Doom Patrol, you would say? There are... As a, Dear listeners, you can't see it, but, but Charles is sporting a fantastic T-shirt. Now, I want that T-shirt. That is a beautiful T-shirt, Charles. Really. Well, thank you. Yes, so, uh, Doom yeah, Patrol T-shirt. Please. My brand new spiffy Doom Patrol T-shirt ordered off of uh, DC Universe's uh, website before they go under. So uh, I want to make sure Ooh, I got my okay. – so, so you might want to check that out and see if they ship to Italy. I will because that's a gorgeous T-shirt. Yeah. Well, okay. But yeah. I'll, sorry, from, sorry, I got in a little Doom Patrol digression there. So no, yeah, exactly. no. But aside from Charles's snazzy clothes, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I should get a boys T-shirt, but I don't have one yet. All right. So, um, anything else about Butcher, Huey, or Mallory before we move on? No, I, th- I know. I think pretty much that's you know we've covered the the majority of the ground there. It's going to be interesting to see how Mallory plays into things, you know, in the grander scheme of things as well. Because yeah. we had had a bit of an introduction to her, I believe, in season one, mm-hmm. where her and Huey had actually met, and she said, "I'm done with this," you know, kind of a, almost a lethal weapon situation of "I'm too old for this kind of this kind of stuff." So, um, yeah, but, she's she's yeah, not so, I mean, she's not going to be the Danny Glover for too long, I don't think. I have that feeling as well, yeah, yeah. but uh, but yeah, so it's you know it's it's obviously a character definitely that's to, to keep an eye on too because she does play you know quite the role. For sure. Yeah, and, and you know even though she's a she's a man in the comics, um, yeah, I no surprise, she, no surprise there, another gender switch, but um, but I think she's going to be someone definitely important to the overall storyline, and definitely someone who's going to be playing. Uh, an important role in the team of the boys and also in Butcher, uh, his his path going forward as well. Yeah. So keep an eye on that. Yeah. All right. Uh, topic number two, since we kind of talked a little bit about Becca and Ryan, let's talk about Homelander and uh, Butcher's wife, Becca, and also presumably their son, Ryan. Yes. So – uh, Homelander decides, well, hey, now's the time for me to do a little father-son bonding time. I'm going to play catch with I'm my gonna, boy. I'm going <laughs> to play catch with his boy. Exactly. What what, what great, wonderful fatherhood than that, right? Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Throwing, the, throwing the ball around with the old, you know, with, the, with your son in the yard and, you know, maybe throwing those balls into orbit occasionally. That's right. But, Who doesn't uh, do that, right? So, so... Um, what did you make of Homelander? Uh, Anthony's Anthony Star is just once again he's very mesmerizing, compelling as a villain, and even when he's just he's there with his son, he can come off as so menacing and threatening, especially to someone like Be- Becca. So, what did you make of I him? Was- you know what? I mean, obviously, I don't want to try and give any, obviously, keeping it as spoiler free as possible. But what I'm thinking is the tension is there all the time whenever Homelander is around. And especially with Ryan, I felt so sorry for Ryan because you can tell he's clearly intimidated. He doesn't really know what to do. And the fact of, you know, it almost seems like uh, when they're when they're playing catch, Homelander seems to be getting pretty irked almost about the fact that, Ryan is not showing off any kind of powers that he might have because obviously Homeland is under the assumption of he's my biological son who will obviously have inherited powers from his dad. So he's obviously going to be a soup just like me. Um, and it almost seems like when he throws the ball and he fails to catch it, he I think he's really holding back and making a method of holding back his irritation 
Because you know that if it had it been somebody else, he would have been all over them, probably you know, flashing one of his little winning smiles and saying, you know, I'm going to destroy you now. Kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, but that, that kind of situation. And yeah, you can tell he's, he's inside. It's eating him inside. that He's not showing off his powers. And I think he also almost is living almost vicariously through his son because he, he talk when they have that talk on the bed, you know, he's sitting on the bed and, you know, wishing his kid good night. And he's saying right. to him, I never had parents and I never had this. And it was a lonely existence and all this kind of thing. It's going to creep a kid that age out. But also I wonder whether he feels I'm telling him the truth because nobody is telling this kid the truth and nobody's being truthful with him. Or he's trying to win him over to his side. It's a complicated situation there because he then confronts Becca, you know, saying, when is somebody going to own up and tell this child that he's special or that he's got superpowers or things of this nature? So, I mean, I'm actually curious on your, your thoughts on that, Charles. I mean, do you think he was kind of trying to bring Ryan over to the dark superhero <laughs> side or do you think he just wanted he just wanted to creep his son out? The dark soup of the force. Yes. Yes, uh, right. No, uh, I, I I agree. That is a that was a very important scene. The way I took it personally, as I was watching that, I saw it as more Homelander is talking to Ryan and actually confiding in him because Ryan, hmm. his son, he feels probably his son is the only person he feels like he can open up to. I think. Hmm. I, th I think Homelander, you know, is is very resentful of having not having parents around as he was raised. Um, that's probably why he has this Oedipal complex to the extreme when it comes to things like breast milk and whatnot. And he's still sniffing the milk. I wanted to throw <laughs> up again there. I was like, and I was like thinking of you in that moment. I was like, why, Charles? Why? <laughs> Just a little breast milk, no big deal. <laughs> little lactation. <laughs> Nick can't even no. handle the word lactation. Interesting. It, it's just, no, because obviously then the whole little mini movie in my mind right. starts going. You know, the reel starts going like no. <laughs> but no, anyways, yeah, uh, mm. you were saying when you came. Good breast milk. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no. Seriously. Um, getting back to the topic. I, if he I, didn't have parents. And, oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. He didn't have parents. So so I really think he was actually trying to relate a little bit mm. and try to make Ryan understand his background so that, um, one, yes, he wants to bring Ryan around to his side. He wants he, – he's obviously dry, trying to drive a wedge between Ryan and his mother, Becca. Mm. But yeah. – so that uh, he wants them to grow closer together. But the way he's going about it is, 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 you know, it's partly manipulative, but I think it's also partly confessional on his part. Yeah. That he's, you know, this is, this is stuff he doesn't talk about to anybody, his, his true feelings. And, and with the Homelander as because of those repressed feelings, it's why I think Homelander is this ticking time bomb of rage ready to go off yep. at any possible second um, yeah. given the circumstances. So, so he finally feels like he can open up to Ryan and, and talks about his own experiences and say, look, you know, um, and, and as a, as a result, he, he comes off as more sympathetic, likable, not just this big guy strolling or stromping, you know, stomping around the house in a, in a big superhero costume with a big patriotic flag cape. He's, yeah. he's more down to earth, if you will. And, um, and uh, it's, it's those softer moments that where he's actually connecting to Ryan a little bit. Also, because, you know, to pick up on that point, maybe, you know, he, he confides in Ryan one, because Ryan is a child and is, the the poster of innocence yes you know he doesn't have any preconceived notions he's not uh, you know he doesn't he, he's still super candid super innocent in that sense because he's 
there's not, you know, he doesn't really sort of have boundaries of, you know, what's good, what's bad kind of thing. He's very, very, still very much a blank slate. And yeah. that's why maybe he feels he can unburden to him, but possibly also because Homelander feels everybody else is beneath him. And the only person that he could possibly relate to was, of course, um, Stillwell, who, of course, who's no longer with us. Yes. And, and that, but that was already a, a very much a tainted relationship as well. So he couldn't really. Un, you know, completely unburdened with her as well. So I think it's because he has nobody else. And plus, he probably feels that biological connection. He's like, this is my kid, you know, I want to do this. I don't, there was one thing that I felt was a bit, I mean, he's trying to, I think, force too much, obviously, because he doesn't know how to do this kind of thing. I totally like agree with he, that, yes. When, when he tells when he tells Ryan, I love you, and Ryan almost refuses to say it and feels almost awkward saying it back, and you wonder whether there Ryan is just like, I don't really love this guy. I don't know how to respond or, you know, it's just like he puts Ryan in a very difficult position, I think, of the in that because like you're supposed to say I love you, too, kind of thing. And it's yeah. like, you know, it's, it's, I, it was very it was a tough, tough scene, that one. Well, you know, you bring up a great point that that Homelander doesn't really know how to how to be a proper father. I think what, what what's going on here is that um, Homelander sees a lot of himself in Ryan, like yeah. he's that he's this young boy who's who has superpowers, whether Ryan realizes this or not, and so he wants him to realize his potential, but he also sees you know he's trying to give Ryan what he feels I think he's missing or he missed in life. You know, the, the exactly. you know, that, that parental guidance that he felt, you know, that is essentially this big void in his life. He doesn't want Ryan to go through that. So he's trying to fill his own void by trying to um, project the, you know, that, that those parental um, uh, misgivings or I'm going to say the, the, the lack of parental guidance that he had on Ryan. So he, so he's kind yeah. of overcompensating a little bit. And another thing that I thought was telling was that he makes this very disturbing comment to Ryan. He says, he, he tells them that they're gods and they can do whatever yeah. they want. So essentially Homelander sees his son, Ryan as another God and so I'm going to raise you to be just like me, and therefore we will lord over all these normal humans. So That's I right want now. you to – this is why I want you to realize your powers and, be, and seize your potential. Yeah, and uh, I, I very much agree because he, he, yeah, he literally wants to turn him into a into a mini version of himself. Yeah. And like you said, the fact that it also ties back to what we'd seen in season one, where he'd been he did that kind of reality show program where he was showing people around his house, you know, yeah. saying this is where I I won all my trophies, this is why my dad and I did this and thing. And maybe that's coming back to haunt him. Of I never really had those memories. It's all fake, you know. Even yeah. when he was telling was all Ryan, fiction. you know, yeah. He, when he said, you know, they were playing, uh, tossing the ball around, he's like, you know, my dad gave me this at the world from the World Series, and then he tells him it's not true. Um, so yeah, I think, like you said, he's trying to give him what he didn't have, probably not in the best way. Uh, you know, he's not. Uh, he's he's like I said, he's overcompensating. He's forcing it on Ryan too much, and you know, I, I for Homelander, the the result might not have you know, the the desired effects. Yeah. Yeah, so obviously this is something that bears watching as season two progresses. Yeah. So that's right. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else about Homelander, Ryan, or Becca in this episode? Mm, well, I'm, the only thing I wanted to say about Becca is it's you can. She obviously wants to get away from from Homelander as much as possible, you know, as quickly as possible. And but it seems that it's almost, almost impossible to do so because yeah. no matter what she tries, Homelander's always onto her, and. 
it's you can really see just the desperation in uh, in her and i i mean i feel so bad for her but at the same time i have to say she's a very gutsy woman you know she definitely has chutzpah as one could say because standing up to the guy you know she's not cowering in fear in front of him she's kind of like standing her ground and you know kind of telling him get the heck out of my house and all this kind of thing but we can tell that at the same time she's terrified. You know, oh. she really wants to get out of there. And I can't blame her for being terrified. Well, she's very protective of Ryan. She cares about Ryan. She doesn't want Homelander anywhere near him. Yeah. And But the problem is, is that um, as we find out in this episode, she's kind of made a very uncomfortable arrangement. And That's right. So that they're in this kind of gated area almost like its own little prison almost and yeah. she has to try to escape this so that she can talk to this guy named dr park in this episode and she's wanting answers she was promised that homelander would never bother them so i think that was part of the deal that she feels that homelander is breaking so essentially she goes to complain about that hey homelander's here Get rid of him. Leave us yeah. alone. And Dr. Park is like, look, uh, we don't want to upset Homelander. So we're not going to we do it. We're not going to do a damn thing. That exactly. Yeah. We're, n- we're not going to, we're not going to, um, uh, just let that go. You know, we're not going to, uh, open that Pandora's box, so to, so to speak. So, uh, good luck. You're on your own. Have fun. <laughs> sorry about, yeah. sorry about your luck. So, um, so, so Becca, yeah, she's just terrified because she's now in this predicament, partially of her own making, I think, that, um, that she and Ryan are, are essentially at Homelander's mercy and no one, and no one, as far as she knows, is coming to save them. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's the thing. It just seems like such a hopeless situation yeah. for so, her and, yeah. And, uh, she's terrified and despairing at this point. All right. Um, topic number three. Let's move on. Let's talk about Starlight and who kind of gets to hang with Stormfront in this episode. Yes. And let's talk about also how uh, A-Train is back on the scene, much to Starlight's chagrin. Mm-hmm. So what did you make of Starlight and Stormfront uh, hanging out now that Stormfront is was- a member of the Seven? It was a very curious matchup. I will say this much. Granted, we hadn't get, gotten much of uh, Stormfront in episode one, so she, we still had to get to know her. Here we get to know her a little bit more, and we can see that she's just so sassy. There's no tomorrow, and she, you know, will say exactly what's on her mind, and she doesn't care how colorful her language is. And even on public television, she's like, you know, happily you know, spouting off whatever comes to, to mind. And, and I think no she's... Filter, no filter whatsoever. Yeah, she pretty much lives completely unfiltered and completely free because she's like, you know, I don't care. I can pretty much say what I want and I'll do what I want. And, and you know, obviously she... Cre- and then and she's very much, I think, that anti-establishment, almost an, an anarchist, if you will, because to her, it's like there are no rules. You know, to, she, to her, I think she does want to focus on her the real job as she calls it which should be you know saving the world and all this kind of thing otherwise she really could not care less and i think at first she gives obviously started a very wide berth because she says to her you know this barbie a bimbo you know kind of prancing around yeah. and like a you know, barbie. Vort's favorite, yeah yeah, yeah vort's favorite daughter and all this kind of thing but it seems like she i think she gives starlight quite the life lesson at a certain point when she, the whole Pippi Longstocking thing, I loved it because I was yeah. actually a big fan of Pippi Longstocking growing up. I actually oh, had. So, so why don't you yeah. just very quickly, because for, I've never read Pippi Longstocking. So really, can, can you very quickly kind of give us a gist of, of, of what the, what the, what the importance of that uh, reference was? Well, it's curious. Well, I mean, I suppose because it's, it's very well known to Europeans because mm-hmm. Pippi Longstocking is actually for a, a Swedish um, character it was created by a Swedish author. Kind of like Heidi, serves. I'm guessing. That's right. Yes. So basically, imagine this, you know, kid with uh, you know bla- flaming red hair mm-hmm. in like pigtails, and she lives alone in this house, and she is, was blessed with this incredible strength, and she just basically goes around. I mean, 
you know, Stormfront puts her out as saying she doesn't, uh, Pippi Longstocking doesn't care. It's not that she doesn't care. She's a child. And so she acts like a child. She's basically one of the little rascals if they had powers. That's basically Got how it. it is. You know, so, okay, so, um, like, and so, yeah, she, so like a super... F- Superpowered version of Spanky and Alfalfa in the game. In the game. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Yeah, and she just you know befriends these these two other kids, and they go on just fun adventures. And she she's very much she tries to help people, but it has disastrous um, you know such, um, effects. Like for example, she's somebody is in trouble. She lifts up a, a truck, for example, right. but she wasn't supposed to. But it's a, it's a very endearing, endearing series of books. And they actually had a short-running TV show, which I used to follow as well, which was kind of fun. So, okay. yeah, that was okay. it was interesting they brought up Pippi Longstocking. <laughs> well, I, pre- I appreciate the information because, you know, like I said, I, I hadn't read Pippi Longstocking, hadn't seen any of the movies. So, um, so I was a little feeling a little out of it. I didn't really do my research on that one. So I'm glad you kind of shared that with us. No problem. I mean, especially since more, like it's said, more, more European. Yeah. It's more of a European thing. Yeah. European yeah. kids are more familiar with, with people long stopping. Got yeah. it. Yeah. I, mean, I know there's been movies and obviously they've aired over here, but, um, I've never experienced those. So it's good to know. Yeah. I, I feel a little bit more cosmo- <laughs> cosmopolitan today. That's good. All right. Um, so you felt that it was kind of a more like a, a very interesting, apt reference, or did you do you think it was a little out of place? I mean, I thought it was a fun reference because you know I can see why Stormfront made the example of Pippi Longstocking because of the fact of being so carefree, and I think that's what Stormfront really is. She's carefree in an adult way, as in she really, like I said, she she doesn't care, um, and. I thought it was interesting at first her co- her costume combination. It did remind me a little bit of of a, of a stormtrooper from the SS because of the kind of black and red. Mm-hmm. Though instead of obviously the swastika, she's got the American flag. So it was like interesting, um, interesting kind of combination there of um, costume wise. So obviously immediately I thought of the SS. But that's <laughs> I had that kind of to. <laughs> kind of a kind of a blitzkrieg motif, if you will. <laughs> You know, that whole yeah. uh, lightning storm, you know, that kind of reference. Storm little, point, yep. Because uh, blitz means the lightning. So essentially a blitzkrieg is a lightning strike in English. That's right. So uh, Yeah, and in so fact uh, – Say I know some course, German. Shoots... I took German in high school, so I know a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the shoot stuff all, all the SS, the two S's are the um, – uh, for the runes, the, obviously the the runes, the Nordic runes, which are kind of like soon stormtroopers. That's what yes. they were at the end of the day. That's where it comes from. Right. But uh, interesting, uh, interesting conversation. I think that, though after their their thing, I think uh, Stormfront is maybe starting to warm up to, to Starlight a little bit, and and I think Starlight is taking a few leaves from Stormfront's book because we just see how she handles the A train situation, and that's I think is also after that sort of talk with Stormfront. I think she's really becoming more ballsy if you will yeah and standing up for herself and i think that's because yeah. you, you talked about stormfront how essentially she's trying to present herself as this rebel i think you know mm. to establishment the anti-authority figure the one that speaks her mind and doesn't sugarcoat it doesn't uh go along with the you know the corporate mentality that vought tries to present to everyone so um, as a result, that's kind of helped her presumably in her social media develop a you know a following. So she tries to that's the uh, the the brand that she wants to present to everybody the the, the image. And so she sees Starlight as essentially the poser that's just doing the corporate bidding and uh, you know following along with whatever the Vought wants. So uh, so. Initially, she doesn't think much of her until um, Starlight, you know, stands up to her and says, look, you know, I'm more than this. And yeah. and that's at that point where, you know, she, Stormfront's kind of like, well, hey, maybe I need to take a second look at you or or what have you. Or maybe you're you're not so uh, not much of a pushover at all or as I thought you were. Yeah. So um, and and you bring up a, another great point that. I think after that conversation that, yeah, she – Starlight kind of used that in her in her dealings with A-Train who just shows up as um, they're giving the series of interviews. And you notice it was kind of like um, a nice little commentary on how 
um, women are compared to men by by interviewers, yeah. you know, talking about like, well, like, well, do you think uh, female heroes make better heroes than men? You know, and always of, being asked the same questions over, over and, and over, over and over. Yeah, again. exactly. So which is obviously very frustrating to a lot of I'm sure a lot of female celebrities that uh, that's all they get asked. And, um, you know, not really trying to get to know them as people, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, start, you know, here's Stormfront being very blunt you know, with the interviewer and then Starlight's just kind of taking it back and. So that kind of sets up their confrontation. And then, but then all of a sudden a train pops out and he's like, Hey everybody, I'm back. A train. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and Starlight who, um, knows that a train knows, uh, about her, um, essentially that, you know, blowing, she could, he could blow her cover as she's trying to do this kind of infiltration of the seven, um, yeah. he, he could do that at any moment. And so that sets up some very tense scenes between those two. Yeah. Um, Hitchcock would be proud of that moment. You think? Seriously. It yeah. was very, very cerebral. I, I mean, I think. You know what? Because, you know, recently um, I, I obviously watched Notorious, obviously, well, for Hitchcock. And so the whole master of suspense and everything. I was like, yeah, see, this is how suspense is done. You know, because I, you know, to go on a brief tangent, Notorious, you know, we thought it wasn't as suspenseful as it could have been when it comes to the Hitchcock, 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 Hitchcock stuff. Um, Easy for you here to say. It was, yes. Yeah, exactly. See, yeah. Getting tongue-tied there. Um, but but yeah, it's not so, just me. So I thought, yeah. But, but here, that was real suspense. Or heck, even Tarantino. It kind of reminded me a little bit of some scenes from Inglorious Bastards as well. Yeah. When, you know, the two people know, like, one of the, between Landa and Shoshana in Inglorious Bastards. It kind of had that feel. I love so that, that scene, really- by the way. I know, you, I, know I'm, it, I know I won't get too far off on the digression. I just want to say I love um, how that's, you know, that um, is carried off. I mean, just. That I mean, it just had you just squirming in your seat as I was watching that in the movie uh, theater yeah. for the first time, because uh, Christoph Waltz is, is a gene, is an amazing actor. He, he's so good in that movie, uh, so yeah. good. So if you haven't seen yeah. Inglorious Bastards, I heartily recommend checking it out. He's so good. <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir here, yeah, exactly, <laughs> for obvious so, reasons. And now I want to go watch Inglorious Bastards. So thank you, for, <laughs> thank you for putting that in my brain. Um, so, so Starlight um, essentially hooks up with Gecko, and who is apparently fresh from his Geico commercials, and um, <laughs> and um, who gets a who finally got her that um, vial of Compound V that she was yeah. blackmailing him for, and so uh, A Train is all like, "Hey, what you got there? What?" What you got? And what do you put in your boots? Yeah, yeah exactly. Kind of so, um, so Starlight is, uh, you know, she's essentially, you know, he's confronting her with that, and he's threatening to say, like, I'm going to tell Homelander everything about you, and then she counters with, well, you're not going to tell him anything because, yeah, I know you p- killed Popclaw, and I have proof to show that wasn't suicide. Yeah, she trumps him on that one. So essentially, it's kind of a um, uh, you know this um, Mexican standoff at this point. And See, Tarantino once again. <laughs> well, I, I was what you did I there, was thinking Charles. I was thinking Sergio Leone personally. Sure, yeah, he was the master of American right. standoffs and that yes. uh, Mexican standoffs, and that's where Tarantino obviously got it from. And yeah. It became a yeah. huge part of Tarantino's movies. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. Essentially, yeah, they, they kind of agree to like, okay, we'll just, you know, put our guns gently down on the table and walk away at this point. So <laughs> what did you make? What did you, so what did you make of, of that scene, that confrontation that, well, where she stands well, up for herself? I was so happy. I was seriously like, you go, girl, because at first I was worried she was going to like kind of cave in. And if he was going to walk away with the compound V and that would have been that because I actually thought to myself, how can she possibly, you know, how you know, can respond she get out of this? To, yeah. yeah. And how is she going to respond to his threat? Because my first thought was either she's going to incinerate him, but he's too fast for that. Or she's going to have to come up with something clever 
in order to tr- to trump what he said and she did and i was so impressed and i was so happy and the fact that she then casually walks up to him takes the vial back and he leaves this kind of almost with his tail between his legs so i thought i was very proud of our girl right there i was very, definitely very very happy yeah it was essentially uh, resulted in a stalemate where they both yeah. know something about the other but they're not really in a position to do anything about it just yet so it's kind of like a to be continued yeah exactly it's kind of all it's this um almost like a very cold war you know like uh the yeah, that's our, right. our you know like well we have missiles you have missiles so just everybody be cool or uh world war 3 is going to break the out the fingers are closed on the buttons right exactly now. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's all like freaky goes to hollywood two tribes music video um, just saying. Nice. Thanks. I like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big Frankie Goes to Hollywood fan, so had to throw that. I love that video. Um, just to see Reagan Dookie one. get out in a in a in a, <laughs> so a cool. kind of like the sumo match thing with um with uh, Yeltsin, I think it was at the time. Oh yeah, yeah, it was Yeltsin. That yeah, was Boris Yeltsin. Yeah, <laughs> love that. Hilarious. That was that was epic. Um, all right. So anything else before we move on? The only thing I wanted to say was, you know, about the questions, the same questions being constantly asked. I could so relate to that because obviously, you know, in my line of work, I have to interview artists on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always try to make my questions super personal. And in fact, it often gets some some interesting reactions because they're totally thrown off and they don't know what to say because they're they're always expecting. So tell us about this new album of yours. Tell us about this song. And you know that they almost have a pre-prepared speech in their heads because they've asked this, they've been asked this stuff over and over again. And what I can say, you know, and it's not they can't, to they you know, can't my re- respond automatically to to whatever you're asking. Yeah, I'd like to throw them a curved ball. Like for example, if I came to your house and opened your fridge, what would be inside it? That kind of stuff. Oh, and they nice. love that. Kind yeah. of, they love nice. these kind of questions because you get to know them more personally. Yeah. And you know, and and the the response so far it's has been very real. positive because. Yeah, it's right, because folks want to know about the person behind the music. Like, I'm sure they wanted to know the people behind the capes rather than what do you think of this, this and this. You know, it makes also the artist, the athlete, whatever, more personable. It's like, oh, like me, this guy watches movies or this guy reads comics. Or, and I think it's that's that's how an interview should be conducted. That's just my personal thought. No, 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 no. you're totally dead on on that one. Yes. Yeah, because... As you know, as someone who obviously watches a lot of that, um, we we don't want the formulaic, we don't want the cookie cutter stuff, we don't want the corporate um, talking points. We want to yeah. know the person, so we want to know their thoughts, and we're trying to get to know them better. So I definitely agree with what you're doing, and I definitely support. That's it. why hockey. That's why hockey interviews are so frustrating. Because they always ask them such dumb questions. They do that like, with. Oh, American... What are you going to do to win in this game? <laughs> they do that with American oh. football too, because they always have this. Um, they always have these press conferences after the game. And... They go in between, like uh, like halftime or those yeah. kind, of, kind of moments, right? But, but in between but, yeah, periods. But they're always these trite uh, questions. They've been asked thousands of. So, coach, uh, you know. Uh, how are you going to come back from this? Or how are you going to come back from this loss? Or, or what are your plans for next week? Or, you know, just the same stupid questions over and over again. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I can imagine. I would just, like, uh, be so frustrated with that. All right. Uh, last topic. Topic number four. We kind of teased this a little bit earlier. Let's talk about Kamiko, the female of the boys. And as we find out in this episode, She's got a brother named Kenji, she does. who just happens to be a superpower terrorist. And um, <laughs> so that'll turn out well, I'm sure. And uh, so what did you make of um, Kimiko reconnecting with her brother? I felt so, I mean, at first I felt so happy for her because they have that wonderful embrace and she, you see her smile and we hadn't seen her smile in a long time. I mean, granted, she had gotten a few nice smiles from, from Frenchie, you know, because of Frenchie, I think. But here you could so see she was so, so happy because this is, you know, her brother and she hadn't seen him for ages. And we find out a little bit more about their past and she, and here she actually communicates because she knows sign language and so she signs to him. And then he obviously answers back to her in Japanese, I believe it is. Um, and uh, Yeah, because he can I speak just, and she can't. Yeah. 
That's right. Yeah. And so he answers her in, first in sign language, then speaks her in Japanese. And um, it was just a beautiful, heartwarming scene, which obviously then has a turn for the worse because we find out that obviously he is all about wanting to kind of fight, you know, and is still anti-America and is all about uh, all the and, and obviously their their ideals clash. And you can see it breaks Kamiko's heart because she's all about, you know, come and join us, you know, be a part of the boys. You know, we're trying to make a Help difference in this kind. Yeah. That's right. And uh, and her dreams are shattered because she's like, I want to finally re- can reunite with my brother. The problem is, you know, her brother is, you know, Kenji is actually uh, the target that uh, the, the butcher is after. And so that always puts a damper on things. And I was just so shocked when he just kind of lifts lifts her up and and throws her into the building. Yeah. Just, I mean, just, yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, it, it kind of complicates things just a little bit is what I... That, oh, yeah. <laughs> that, um... Yeah, because, you know, he, we find out um, Kenji is a member of the one of the Shining Light Liberation Army. Shining Light, yeah, the name was Which on is, the, the tip of my tongue, I couldn't remember, yeah. Yeah, but uh, this terrorist group who kidnapped her initially. And, so, and I believe killed their parents. And killed their parents, yeah. So, so essentially it's Kimiko realizing, well, my brother, who I love more than anything – has joined the the very same people that killed our parents and torched our village and and yeah. and all that and and essentially put me in the position where I ended up. So yeah. uh, very conflicting feelings for her. She's trying to you know, and then obviously Butcher isn't making like you said isn't making anything any easier because essentially this is the guy that that um, he promised Mallory. So, um, so she's gonna gonna have to go against Butcher as well, and there's this fight that breaks out in the costume shop, which I thought was a very interesting place to have a a fight, <laughs> not a superhero yeah. TV show, right? TV drama. That, the only uh, time I'd seen something like that might have been, you know, in Batman sixty six. Probably <laughs> in, in a show like that, it might have worked. Yeah, exactly. You almost expected the zap, pow, bam, <laughs> biff. <laughs> Or someone doing the Batu Seas at one at one point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Batu Very points for uh, Nick for referencing the Batu Um <laughs> So so essentially, you know, she escapes with her brother and a little bit, and she sits him down for a little heart to heart, and talks about, you know, she talks about what happened to her. Says, you know, they made her a monster, and her brother talks about it. Well, they said they did the same to me that they did to you. So essentially, you know, he's obviously got, she has powers, he's got powers. So what happens, of course, um, a fight breaks out. And, yeah. um, you know, they get into a fight. Kenji attempts to run, but. Kimiko eventually gets a hold of him, and it's a pretty cool action sequence between them as they're kind of like um, chasing each other and fighting each other throughout the city. And, and he's throwing her all over the place. I mean, when he throws yeah. her into that building, yeah. was that building, I mean, just uninhabited? I mean, was it like an abandoned well, no. building? Well no. well, no, it wasn't, as we find out, because, um, you know, as as they, they're fighting, they go into that building um, – Stormfront's there, and yeah, um, essentially that um, you know that um, she, uh, I guess they. Um, oh, wait, wait a minute, am I jumping ahead? Maybe I'm jumping ahead here. Yeah, yeah, because all we okay. see is he never mind. Lifts her For up. Everybody, forget yeah. what I just said. <laughs> forget that. <laughs> forget. That. Strike that. Erase it. So, Norm- normalize the ray time. I was. Um, I was <laughs> yeah, yeah. Forget. Anyway. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah, no, because what I'm saying is that because we don't see her, so we see her as being inhabited because he just lifts her up and tosses her into that building. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I'm sure there were people like having dinner or watching TV and yeah. they see a woman kind of. <laughs> yeah, just, you're just kind of like looking by, like, you know, taking it's like one of those. Um, I'm thinking of like the diner scene in Superman 2 where like one guy takes a bite of <laughs> yeah. soup or something, you know, like he, he takes a mouthful of soup and then all of a sudden just somebody whizzes right by him and, you know, <laughs> you know at the, 
So um, yeah, exactly, that's what made me think. I could I almost imagine people like watching Little Orphan Annie on TV or something super bland, and yeah. this woman it's just kind of, of crashes through their wall. Yeah, just you know, just kind of sitting there, you know, having your dinner, eating away, and then all of a sudden, the push, blast right through, and still eating away, oblivious of what's going on. Uh, but um, so she puts him in a chokehold. Kamiko does, yeah. and he passes out. So this is at this point the boys show up in their van, their big A team van, and they put him in the back of the van. And this is where um, Butcher decides, oh, "I'm going to just deck Huey." To end the episode. Yeah, first he can like congratulates Kamiko, kind of like you know, thanks for taking care of this guy for us. Yeah. And then boom, yeah, he just decides to give give Huey one for good measure. Yeah, exactly. So so good job, Kamiko. Huey, pow, <laughs> right in the kisser. <laughs> So that's right. And Huey's just like, what the hell, man? <laughs> so, yeah. No, and I like that kind of, I believe it's uh, mother's milk from the van. It's like, Huey, are you coming or not? <laughs> <And> the guy's <laughs> like face down on the I know. ground. I know. He's just, like, he's trying to think, remember where he is. Cause he got cold cocked and he's just lying there with blood coming out of his mouth. Just like, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh, that was and, great. <laughs> yeah, just um, you know, don't drive off without me. I was waiting for them to drive off without him, personally. But <laughs> that's what I was thought. I thought suddenly you know, you're going to hear yeah. the the motor revving up and yeah. off, and they're gone. Yeah, you'd be like, what? Where would everybody go? Don't leave me. All right. Anything else about this episode that we overlooked? I mean, all in all, all, all in all, it was it was a great episode. Granted, I think you know, I was the the first episode had such a rush for me because obviously it was so sort of action packed if you will this one i think it was more a lot of exposition obviously and giving us a little bit more of the deep dive into the characters especially homelander and also you know we got a little bit of a, a sweet moment between mave and her ex-girlfriend as well which was a an important one as well because we know the whole thing that um Ma- mave reveals to her ex-girlfriend in hospital yeah she had a, had like an appendix or something that she had to be operated on so mave goes to visit yeah. her yeah and she kind of tells, so, you know, if Homelander ever finds out, you know, you're going to be, you, you, you know, your ass is grass, literally. So he's um, like supremely jealous. So, yeah. And and then and, and she's like, you're telling me this now <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you wanted me to be honest. So, <laughs> yeah, be careful what you wish for. So we did have kind of a tender moment when it came to Maeve. And I think it shows that she's turning a corner when it comes to her allegiance with the seven and everything else, because here she's like thinking about all the terrible things that Homelander has done. And she's still reading from that terrible plane uh, situation that we'd seen in season one. So yeah, I think this will obviously bode for a lot when it comes to the character of Maeve and the decisions she will make down the line. Yeah. Obviously we've watched season two, so we know how it plays out, but so obviously it's something to watch. We'll just leave that there. All right. Yeah. All right. Favorite quotes. Do you have any favorite quotes you want to share? Um, the, well, the one that stuck in my head the most was uh, the one that Stormfront when she said, you know, there's the, the big difference between people don't know the difference between being nice and being good. Mm-hmm. And I thought that is so true. I mean, I actually know people who, who still don't know that difference between being nice and being good. That was one of the most poignant, poignant quotes to me. And then, of course, you know, the whole Pippi Longstocking story, which obviously I'm not going to quote now because we'd be here all day. But <laughs> that was probably my, one of my favorite moments in, in that episode. Charles, what about you? Yeah, I actually had that Pippi Longstocking quote if you're interested. But <laughs> if you want to, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. Yeah, I just have a, I'll just do a quick couple ones. Stormfront obviously gets a lot of the best lines of this episode. She does. Stormfront, when when she's kind of pulling Starlight aside of talking about Ashley, says, geez, if she vibrates any faster, that stick up her ass is going to explode. <laughs> yeah, it's a great one. That was a great one. And something I kind of I loved kind of between Huey and Butcher, where Huey's just like, who's the contact? What's their actual name? And Butcher's like, you'll love it. And Huey, <laughs> Huey's like, no, I won't. I won't love it. I never love it. Never effing love it. <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah, I thought that was funny. All right. What's your rating, sir? I'm going to give this an eight and a half out of ten. Uh, smashing walls, I think, will be a good one. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. 
We are in sync. I am also going to give this one eight and a half out of ten. I'm going to go eight and a half out of ten cups of hallucinogenic mushroom tea. Oh, perfect. <laughs> My backup was baseballs in orbit, by the way, in case you're wondering. Oh, that was a, that was a good one, too. But yeah, I, I, you know, we didn't talk much about the deep, but uh, needless to say, the deep kind of explores his own issues with women. Thanks to the help of yeah. talking to his own gills and, ba- and basically coming to terms that, you know, he's kind of self-hating as a result. That it was written. Well, the only thing I'm going to say about that it was so weird. It kind of reminded me of like early James Gunn films, i.e. Super. It was a moment yes. that could have been taken right out of the Super. It's very surreal, very surreal, dark humor a little bit. But yeah, yeah it's, it was it was very interesting to watch. Let's just put it that yes. way. <laughs> and Patton Oswalt. Chef's kiss, perfection. Oh yeah, it was fantastic. I just wonder when he went into the recording booth whether he knew what he what he was going to actually be doing the voice work for. Oh, I'm sure he did. <laughs> I'm sure, and I'm sure probably he, why he signed up for. I'm sure he loved the gig. It. I'm sure he loved it. Yeah, because he's a bit of a geek. Our Patton Oswalt. He is. That so, he is. So he's a fellow geek. So we have to give him our props. Certainly. All right, Phantom Zone news. The only news I have is something that just came out today where we found out that the upcoming Disney Plus series, Moon Knight, based on the Marvel comic superhero, has apparently in the process of casting Oscar Isaac as Mark Spector, a.k.a. Jake Lockley, a.k.a. (laughs) Stephen Grant, a.k.a. Moon Knight. So if you're a Moon Knight fan, you get that joke, but... Yes. Because it turns out, you know, Moon Knight it has suffers from dissociative identity disorder and sort of, has yeah. alternate personas, shall we say, that started off as aliases and then kind of became alternate personas. But Oscar Isaac is apparently going to be Moon Knight, which is pretty cool. Very excited about that. Yeah. So whenever whatever century we end up getting to see Moon Knight, hopefully not too long from now, but it's supposed to be coming out sometime at the, at the moment at 2022. So fingers crossed. He's hoping that doesn't change. Fingers crossed the planet Earth gets his act together and we can get our Marvel TV shows when we need them most. Yeah. So Indeed. I'm still waiting on WandaVision here. I'm still yeah. waiting on WandaVision's date to be changed. Supposedly December, but we'll find out. <laughs> Fingers crossed for that as well. We still don't have a date for that yet, but... I don't know if you had anything, but that, that was all I had. No, no, no. I mean, I think I think that's pretty much it. Because, like I said, everything being so uncertain, yeah. I just I'm, I'm not going to kind of put a date on anything at this point because, you know, seeing so many things constantly postponed. You know, like Black Widow, we were supposed to get, ain't going to happen. Yeah. Um, so that's why I said I'm just holding out hope that December we will at least get one division. I'm just hoping for that because I'm really, really excited about that show and I really hope it will they will stick to it and give us one division for December. I am too, because you know, especially after the last trailer they came up with, I'm really done with that. So Yeah, they really kind of have us foaming at the mouth for this 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 uh, this show. They keep teasing and teasing. It's like, okay, th- give it to us already. Yes. Give it to me. I need it now. <laughs> That's right. Give me all the Wanda visions. <laughs> now we did get some Phantom Zone fan mail. Very short Ooh. one. Very short one, but we did get one. So I'm going to give special thanks to hey David K Proctor. Yay! Next stop everywhere listener extraordinaire and occasional special guest companion on Next Stop Everywhere wrote in after listening to our discussion of the boys episode one of season two last Sweet. week. So uh, thank you, Dave, for writing thank in. You. We can call him Dave on Next Stop Everywhere, so we can call him Dave here on the Phantom Zone as well. <laughs> Writes in and he says, talking about the boys, he says, I enjoyed this season. I really enjoyed this recap and exchange of ideas. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. We definitely appreciate it. I look forward to the remaining episodes. And that was it. Very Yay. short short and sweet, but... And succinct, you know, to the point. Definitely appreciated nonetheless. Thank you very much, Dave. So thank you, Dave. Glad you're listening. I hope you keep listening. And if you got any thoughts about the upcoming episodes of The Boys Season 2, please share them with us because we'd love to get, your, get to hear your thoughts as well as we discuss the uh, next six episodes. Totally agree. Yeah, for sure. Thank you again, Dave. For sure. Yeah, thank you. And then, so if you want to be like Dave, and hey, who doesn't? Because Dave's awesome. He wrote in and uh, give us some love and definitely appreciate that. Nice compliment. Write to us at Fandom Zone Fan Mail. So you can write, reach us at Fandom Zone Cast. At gmail.com. That's fandomzonecast at gmail.com. The Gmail. 
and G-Mail. the Gmail, a little Ghostwood reference there. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> where have I heard that? Before? Yeah, where? I don't wonder. I wonder. <laughs> Uh, can't because I'm hosting both of those uh, with uh, Zan. Or you can reach us on Twitter at Fandom Zone Cast on Twitter, Facebook, the Fandom Zone Podcast, or Instagram at Fandom Zone Podcast. Nick, where can they reach you and listen to all of your dulcet tones? <laughs> well, thank you, Charles. Well, when it comes to me, it, of course, for you country music fans, I do host the Whiskey and Cigarettes show where we play today's country, traditional country, and everything else in between. For more information about that and where to tune in, you can visit our website. That's whiskeyandcigarettesshow.com. Of course, if you are fans of uh, Oscar-winning movies, I also co-host uh, Gold Standard, the Oscars movie podcast with Rachel Friend and Zan Sprouse. We're going through all the movies that won the Oscar for Best Picture from 1927's Wings to Present day if you'd like to join us for a review of a certain movie a certain oscar winning movie you can hit us up on our email that's goldstandardoscars at gmail.com and uh yeah i think that's that pretty much wraps it up because you know other than that i i, I have the pleasure of working with this fine gentleman on Who? of course uh, <laughs> yeah, the guy behind you, Charles. Oh, <laughs> me? Really? Yeah. And of course, I, I mean, I, yeah, I'm going to actually steal this one from you. Um, also, I, I've recently joined the Titan Talk family, and the Charles and I had a great time discussing the second season of Doom Patrol. Doom Patrol. Which the, 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 the very handsome Charles Skaggs is, is showing a beautiful T-shirt of. So definitely check that out as well. That's Titan Talk, the Titans podcast. What about you, Charles? I love it when you do that. All right. Uh, of course, as for me, you can reach me at Charles Skaggs on Twitter, at Charles Skaggs on Instagram, Facebook, of course, Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio, and my blog of geeky things. Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot where I talk about comic book sci-fi news casting news like hey moon Knight. you want to check those out also news of my other podcasts i do for southgate media including hey the aforementioned titan talk the titans podcast where as nick said we talk titans and doom patrol and eagerly awaiting season three so we're kind of like on hiatus hoping to kind of get enough titan season three news that we can do in maybe an episode that'd be fun listeners have actually been writing in asking us you know titan season three we're like we're waiting for it too pretty much yeah you know like uh, we're writing we're in the same boat you guys are so hoping that they'll get their act together and get that on hbo max pronto quick but other than that of course uh, next stop everywhere the doctor who podcast they do with hey dj nick or you know my co-host my partner in time jesse jackson or other special guest companions where we talk Doctor Who, Torchwood, Sarah Jane Adventures, and much, much more. I hope you check that out. And, of course, Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast, where the aforementioned Zan Sprouse and I talk, of course, Twin Peaks, David Lynch, and recently just wrapped up our six-episode run of The X-Files, where we talked Twin Peaks actors appearing on The X-Files. So we finished that up, and now coming up on our next episode, episode 87, we're going to be talking The Elephant Man, the David Lynch film Radio from 1980 time. that just came out in a Criterion Collection Blu-ray release. So we're going to split that up into two episodes. We're going to talk the movie first in episode 87, and then in episode 88, we're going to run down all the special features featured on the Criterion Collection Blu-ray release. So I hope everybody nice. checks that out. It's an amazing film. We've got like, oh, hey, the late Sir John Hurt, a.k.a. the War Doctor from Doctor Who. Sir Anthony Hopkins. Yes, Hannibal the Cannibal Lecter. And Sir John Gilgood. A lot of sirs in this one. And Bancroft and a bunch of other people. So pretty, uh, pretty amazing film. And uh, hope everybody checks that out. Certainly, yeah, it's it's quite it's a, it's a great movie. I'm surprised it was never even like nominated for any kind of Academy Awards or anything like that, Charles, because it's a really excellent film. Right, and like I said, an excellent cast as well. And uh, it was only David Lynch's second feature film, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. So uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Hope everybody digs that. Next time on the Fandom Zone, well, hey, episode 193, as we talk over the hill with the swords of a thousand men. It's a great title, right? Take that, Titans and Doom Patrol with your, like, simple <laughs> one word. Robin. Two. Yeah, Robin. Dick Simon. Grayson. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you do an episode title. So, uh, Over the Hill with the Swords of a Thousand Men, the third episode of The Boys Season 2, where uh, things are going to be taking a very interesting turn. 
And as I talked about, we're going to get a little bit more with Kimiko and her, and her brother Kenji. And Stormfront does something horrible, which is not yep. the first time that she does something horrible. Or, or maybe it is the first time she does something horrible, but it certainly won't be the last. Nick, any final thoughts? Well, though, I'm really looking forward to, see, to discussing episode three, because like you said, we definitely turned quite the corner in this season with that episode. It's a very pivotal episode. So very much looking forward to that. And uh, Charles, as always, it's such a joy, you know, talking these, uh, you know, the boys with you and spending time with you and just talking, you know, geeky things. So, you know, I once again cannot thank you enough for, you know, inviting me uh, you know, to do this with you. So I, I, I greatly appreciate that. We lost Jesse, but thankfully Nick was there and more than happy because, hey, Nick's is enjoying it. I'm enjoying this, and hopefully you guys out there are enjoying it as well. Yeah. So come on back, episode 193, Over the Hill with the Swords of a Thousand Men. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we'll see you next time right here, the Phantom Zone Podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Jump.